Uh, good morning from the UK. My name is Peter Gottfried of Cambridge Carbonates and thank you for finding the time to attend this uh, webinar on Cretaceous Sequence Stratigraphy and Paleogeography of the Arabian Plate that I'm presenting jointly with Imaged Reality. The aims of this webinar is to look at the Cretaceous petroleum systems of the Arabian Plate using our regional paleogeographic maps. These are based on third order sequences that we've correlated across the productive area of the uh, Arabian Plate and we have paleogeographic maps at systems tracks for the whole of the Phanerozoic. So this is an example of one of our paleogeographic maps. It stretches from Iraq down through the Gulf states through to Oman and up to the uh, Sagros Suture. I'll explain what all the colours mean uh, later on in the seminar. This is a fairly low resolution image and there'll be plenty of opportunities uh, so that I can show you the high resolution images zoomed up to show what uh, the detail facies distribution and the data that we've compiled to, uh, compile, to, to put these maps together. I want to focus on four case histories in carbonate and mixed plastic, uh, carbonate plastic settings. And I will be expanding on these and present more case histories in a remote workshop. I will present, be presenting with image reality on the 30th October through to the 3rd of November. Okay, some remarks on the methodology of constructing these paleogeographic maps and also their history. In 1992, we did a sequence stratigraphic study uh, involving uh, correlation and paleogeographic mapping of northern Iraq. From 1992 to 2000, we extended this stratigraphic scheme and the, our paleogeographic mapping to all of Iraq. And in 2000 to 2001, my colleague, Andrew Horbury, and I must give him co almost complete credit for putting together all the uh, uh, regional information on these maps, he was invited to be a co-author on this industry standard publication, Arabian Plate Sequence Stratigraphy. And since then, we've been busy updating and extending uh, the paleogeographic maps through the Gulf states and to the northeast to the Zagros Suture. Um, we therefore have a robust sequence stratigraphic framework it's based on correlation of plate-wide third order maximum flooding surfaces, which are termed K10 to K190. And I'll be using that terminology through the uh, webinar. Uh, this is based entirely on published lithostratigraphy and time stratigraphic uh, work, including biostratigraphy, strontium isotope stratigraphy. Now, in during our work, our original interpretation has expanded from recognizing 19 sedimentary sequences to 30 third order se sedimentary sequences throughout the Cretaceous. And for each of these sequence, we have low stand, transgressive, maximum flood and high stand systems tracks are defined. And then we plugged in the sedimentological information based on outcrop, core, wells, logs, seismic geometries, and these are posted on, on base maps. Everything I've, uh, about these maps and what I present today and in the webinar and, and in the uh, workshop uh, at the end of October is based on published uh, material. Each map is identified by the maximum flooding surface um, of the sedimentary sequence. Okay, if we now look at the um, general Cretaceous plate tectonic setting uh, of the, the Ara Arabian plate area, um, from the late Jurassic through to the late Cretaceous, um, it was the Arabian plate was essentially a passive margin uh, on the southwest uh, margin of the Neotethist Ocean. And throughout much of this time, the ocean was uh, expanding and we didn't really see any evidence of convergence until the very late uh, stage of this uh, time interval. From the late Cretaceous through to the early Cenozoic, uh, Neotethys begins to close and we begin to see evidence of ophiolite abduction along the uh, uh, Zagros margin. Uh, we do not see the actual continental margin uh, in, in the uh, area because it is uh, buried underneath the uh, Zagros suture. So we are looking at this uh, 
continental margin without actually seeing the uh, margin into the uh, near Tethys ocean. Now, if we look at the uh, general isopack of the uh, Cretaceous, the, the Cretaceous is thickest up to 10 kilometers in the Zagros suture and is also thick along the uh, Rubalkali Oman mountain axis. And it thins to zero mainly by onlap uh, towards the Arabian uh, shield. And there are major depositional highs in the Fars province of Iran and also in the along the Hail Rutba arch in the north of the plate. So this is a general stratigraphic architecture of the Cretaceous. This chronostratigraphical diagram is based on our work in Iraq and it's published in the Petroleum Geology of Iraq book. Um, I've also added the strontium isotope curve and in general terms the first order sea level uh, curve from high sea level to low sea level. The Cretaceous comprises two mega sequences named the AP8 mega sequence and the AP9 mega sequence. And this has been split into six super sequences, each of which are separated by major unconformities. And we get thinning and onlap to the Arabian Shield to the west. From the Baremian to the Aptian, that is. Uh, AP8, sequences one and two, uh, the general setting was a passive margin. And these unconformities are marked by various tectonic events, uh, either thermal doming in the Arabian Shield or are marked by different stages in the opening of the uh, Mid-Atlantic, which created slightly uh, different reorientation of uh, plate movements. The framework for Cretaceous deposition really um, starts in the um, late Jurassic and the basins of deposition and the structural highs are inherited from uh, late Jurassic structures. This is a uh, total isopack of the Thamama group, which is the API 8, 1 and 2 super sequences. And this is thickest in the older Jurassic uh, basin centers, for example, northeast Iraq and Luristan and also Oman, Abu Dhabi area. And you can see clearly the influence of north south structures in the area, um, Qatar Dome, Gawa, Bergan High and so forth, um, exerting the influence over deposition during the Cretaceous. This is a chronostratigraphic chart uh, that now summarizes the um, stratigraphy of the uh, southern Iraq through to uh, the Gulf area and in, into Oman. And we see the same general uh, pattern of deposition. And um, we have these major uh, super sequences separated by these major unconformities. Now, from now on, I want to look at the Cretaceous in terms of a four case histories that involve mixed uh, clastic carbonate deposition, looking at the interaction of clastics and carbonates in the Ratawi limestone shale. Then I'll be moving uh, up stratigraphy, looking at the uh, interactions between uh, platform carbonates and the Bab Basin. Then I'll be looking at the Maudud, and then I'll be looking at the Mishrif, and then finishing off with a summary of the uh, Upper Cretaceous. So that is my cue to switch to strap box. So this is a series of our paleogeographic maps that have been um, selected to illustrate the deposition of the uh, Ratawi uh, limestone and Ratawi shale in the northern part of the Gulf. Um, this is the late Valanginian low stand map to the K40 maximum flooding surface. So the white means exposure or non-deposition. The blue colors indicate carbonate deposition. The paler blue, the higher energy 
shallower water. So these dark blue and the grey areas indicate deposition in these intra-shelf basins. So this is an example of the casted uh, top to the Ratawi limestone that formed during the low stand to the K40, the sedimentary sequence that K contains the K40 maximum flooding surface. And we see evidence here of a shallow uh, water carbonate deposited in a carbonate ramp setting with various indicators of castification, for example, with brecciated intervals, and we also have later cavities. Here is an example of what it looks like in core. So here we have a core section with a cross-cutting cavity infilled with a uh, glauconitic sandstone, in this case, that's uh, sitting within this shallow carbonate ramp uh, carbonate. If we move now to the transgressive systems tract, so this is the facies pattern we get after the casted surface of the Ratawi limestone has been flooded. So here, uh, again, the blue colours are carbonates, so that, that we've got a uh, shallow uh, to mid-ramp carbonates in this mid-blue, mid deeper ramp carbonates in a band around the intra-shelf basin, which is uh, represented in grey. The orange through yellow colours represent uh, plastic environments. Again, the darker, in, in this case, the darker the colour, the more marginal marine the plastics are. These bright yellow are shallow marine plastics, this pale yellow is deeper marine plastics. And during the low stand, we had a large influx of plastics to the uh, area. And we see these relatively coarse plastics that are uh, reworked in a shallow marine environment. So this is the depositional setting for the uh, these these carbonates in the transgressive systems tract. So these are sands that have been introduced during the low stand and then are being reworked during the um, the transgressive uh, during the transgression. And these sands are introduced by a series of uh, delta fluvial and deltaic systems. If we go now to the maximum flooding surface, We see these very characteristic uh, plastic sand bodies, these transgressive sand bodies that essentially coarsen up from uh, bioturbated fine sands into cross bedded uh, coarser sands and then are abandoned at the top. So it's at this point that the sand supply runs out and the uh, sea level, relative sea level rises, uh, drowns the carbonate plat. Uh, drowns the uh, uh, plastic sand body and then you have the maximum flood which is represented by these deep marine shales and the cut off and drowning of the plastic supply allows these um, deposition of carbonates over the um, shelf area and the this is the depositional model here are these transgressive coarsening upward sand bodies that are then progressively drowned by the uh, during the transgression, and then the maximum flooding surface is represented by this um, deep marine shale that blankets the whole area. During the high stand. We see general um, deposition of distal marine plastics represented by this dark brown ornament with a few um, shallow, uh, low energy uh, storm deposited sands. And also we're getting patches of bioclastic production over the shelf. And the reason for that 
is that these sands are being introduced uh, at various points along the um, basin margin. So the plastic intro introduction of plastics is not uniform. So where you get a delta low prograding into the shelf, you get poisoning of the shelf area, which suppresses carbonate production. But areas along the shelf where there's no introduction of plastics, um, you tend to, these tend to be the areas where a certain amount of carbonate production is allowed. Okay, let me now return to the uh, PowerPoint. I now want to uh, move up section into a more carbonate dominated uh, environment and also move down to the um, lower part of the uh, Arabian Gulf and look at the Schweiber Carbonate Bab Basin system. So during the late uh, Valanginian to Aptian, uh, this shows the uh, early in Aptian high stand to the K170 maximum flooding surface. And this really represents the uh, lower Schweiber formation, which can be regarded as um, the last of the Thamama ramp-like systems. <clears throat> and it's at this point when we had the development of these uh, intra-shelf basins, uh, the Bab Basin here, and a further the Garao Basin in uh, northern uh, Iraq. And the general depositional systems is uh, expressed here, where we have a series of Kleiner forms represented by shelf margin carbonates, prograding and aggrading uh, relative to the uh, margins of the Bab Basin. Um, the main reservoir facies are in the shelf margin facies with the development of Rudis rudstone and associated bioclastic packstone and grainstone with uh, wax stones, pack stones, and uh, deposited downslope, and also uh, low energy uh, facies such as his biotabated argillaceous mudstone and argillaceous mudstone in the Bab Basin itself, which has formed a uh, quite an important local uh, source rock. So if we look now at the details of the evolution of the uh, Bab Basin in uh, UAE, UAE and Oman, um, this is the late Aptian transgressive systems track to the K85 maximum flood. And uh, this, this is one of these extra uh, sedimentary sequences we've had to define. Now, if you look at the work of Pearson 2010, um, you can identify or he has identified a number of progradational events into the uh, Bab Basin. Now, this, these progradational events are probably taking place at a higher order, uh, represent higher order cyclicity within the Bab Basin. So these are third order maps, so we can't really map the uh, individual uh, progradational events but we can identify an area uh, over which this progradation happens. Um, and the depositional model during the transgressive parts of the uh, third order cycles is expressed here. We have a general ramp uh, configuration of the carbonate system going from intertidal to shallow marine uh, lagoonal mudstones with muddy sands and then uh, a mid ramp or shelf interior setting with um, algal patch reefs and then going into the intra shelf basin with carbonate muds. Now, as I cycle through the next sli three slides, I want you to focus on this area of the uh, paleogeographic map because that will show you how the uh, geometry of the uh, intra shelf basin margins are changing uh, during. Um, transgression, maximum flood and high stand. So the next map is going to be the maximum flood. So you can see uh, higher sea level, the basin margin has widened. So the area of the basin has um, changed somewhat. The next map is the high stand when you get progradation of the uh, platform margins and you can see it's narrowed again. And this 
has a slightly different um, sedimentary uh, facies model. Um, we begin to see the development of rudest shoals in during these high stands, and you get a, a platform interior complex of uh, algal uh, rudest caprinid biostromes, and then an outer uh, platform margin uh, complex where you get rudest uh, mounds at the uh, actual shelf break with shallow marine orbitulinid muds in between passing out into resedimented carbonates and out into the uh, basin itself. Now, this is where the, um, this is an illustration of the um, details of the uh, prograde's uh, that, that that have been picked up on uh, seismic attribute analysis. So this is a section through the margin of um, the Bab Basin going from uh, platform interior through to the uh, Kleiner forms developed along the margin of the Bab Basin. And this represents a time slice which shows nicely the different facies um, developed in association with the uh, margins of the Bab Basin and the surrounding carbonate platform. We see these platform interior uh, facies with these structures on it, which may well be these rudest patch reefs I mentioned. And also we see this linear fabric, which shows in very great detail the actual formation of the uh, Kleiner forms as the pro uh, carbonate system has uh, prograded. And then when, when once we get into the uh, deeper water of the Bab Basin again, we uh, go into this more uniform facies. And looking uh, at other seismic attributes, in this case, uh, amplitude anomalies, uh, this is along the eastern margin of the Bab Basin. We can see that there is lateral facies variation along strike of these uh, Kleiner forms. And these may represent carbonate shoals at the shelf margin. And this would be a very good uh, tool to try to map the detailed facies and distribution of reservoir quality uh, throughout the uh, along the uh, uh, prograde's into the Bab Basin. So what we're seeing here is um, a large variation of uh, sedimentary geometries. Uh, from Aptian cycles two to four, we get initial aggradation, building up the platform margin, and then. The final um, cycle, Aptian 5, we see a major shift, a uh, downshift of the sedimentary sequences. We get a sea level drop. So the uh, platform margin is exposed. Uh, and this is accompanied by some introduction of plastics into the system. But the carbonate system then migrates into the shallow water down the margins of the uh, Bab Basin. And you begin to get these prograding and downstepping uh, Kleiner forms. Okay, I want now to look at a third case history of the Maudud formation uh, in Kuwait. And again, this is where I have to quit, uh, swap into uh, Stratbox. So we were um, have published a paper on the Maudud Reservoir of the Bergan Field. And um, this, this is quite an unusual uh, part of the uh, Maudud formation because it is extremely thin, uh, probably maximum 10 meters thick. And one of the interesting things about the uh, Maudud is you get a dramatic northward thickening of the um, formation. So in Bergan, it's some 10 meters thick, go north into North Kuwait, and it's probably 450 to 500 meters in thickness. Um, at this point, we are looking at the uh, paleogeographic map showing the uh, deposition of the Maudud carbonate phase. And we're in a relatively shallow water uh, carbonate platform system system fringing an intra-shelf basin. 
So further to the north, uh, you go into a, uh, a ramp like fasces where you go from uh, into deeper water and eventually into this uh, intra-shelf basin. That is the uh, early Albion high stand to the K110 maximum flood. If we go back in time and look at the transgressive systems track to the K110 maximum flood, the class the system is somewhat uh, is dominated by clastic. So this is the Maudud sandstone, and we are looking at a series of um, shallow marine and pro deltaic uh, sandstones. This is a core from the um, Bergan field uh, logged by my colleague. And we see this lower Maudud sandstone, which was deposited in um, shallow marine to pro deltaic fasces. This is then replaced by the Maudud carbonate member. And we go from uh, there's a deep water fasces here. So we get that would be the um, K110 maximum flood. And then we go into a shallow water carbonate system. And uh, that is the uh, high stand to the K110 maximum flood. So the carbonates are represented by this map and the clastics are represented by this map. And we also have a fairly major cast surface at the top of the Maudud over Bergan. And uh, this wasn't the only well we looked at. We looked at a number of wells and we found that there was a number of uh, depositional cycles through uh, in, in, in this. And this is a schematic uh, of the uh, succession through the um, Mem, uh, Maudud carbonate member across Bergan. Um, our brief was to try to understand the pore systems within the um, Maudud member and how it might be uh, contribute to development. So we were able to look through uh, and find uh, that the Maudud carbonate member is actually a consists of two higher order cycles, each punctuated by uh, cast, uh, an interval of karstic exposure. And the depositional porosity is uh, best development, best developed and enhanced associated with these periods of castification uh, associated with these higher order cycle boundaries. Okay, returning to uh, the PowerPoint, I now want to talk about the Mishrif um, case history. I'm going to be looking first of all at the general depositional setting of the Mishrif carbonates and then looking at the uh, the top Mishrif unconformity, this one of these major unconformities which has quite a, a significant control on the uh, distribution of Mishrif reservoir fasces and also on the uh, uh, reservoir quality within the uh, Mishrif. So the Mishrif formation is the main producing horizon uh, within Iraq, and this is associated with the uh, Middle Senamanian uh, K132 high stand. And the main carbonate reservoir fasces are rudstone and grainstone sand bodies that are dominated by rudest debris. And these are generally located along the shelf margin. So these are these paler uh, lines surrounding of, of high energy uh, shelf margin fasces surrounding these uh, pale blue areas of shelf interior. The green areas represent um, peri uh, peritidal areas uh, within the carbonate platform. And these are surrounded by these intra-shelf basins in various shades of grey. 
and we find there's a stru local structural control on shelf margins and the main reservoir quality is commonly open primary porosity without very much uh, diagenetic modification that's that's the story in uh, Iraq where there's not there's been very little modification by the uh, top uh, Mishrif unconformity. Uh, this is the depositional setting. So this ridge represents this um, carbonate platform running through the uh, center part of the country here. Um, we have uh, locally, this is uh, fault controlled and we have uh, fasces developed our rudish shoals uh, along the margin with uh, minor rudis buildups uh, developed uh, on, on, on the high with associated reworked uh, rudis sands. The, the basin uh, to the northeast, the Balambo Garao Basin, is always an open marine basin because it's facing the open continental margin. However, the basin to the uh, west and southwest is a restricted basin because that's onlapping the uh, exposed. Uh, Arabian uh, shield. So this is the general cross section of depositional environments along that line. Um, best reservoir quality flanking the uh, carbonate platform developed along the margins of the structural high with a restricted basin. Uh, some limited development of uh, carbonate systems against the uh, Arabian shield, but these are uh, eroded. This basin's open marine, this basin is restricted. So when we drop sea level, we expose the um, carbonate platform with the development of karstification. The basin facing the open marine area remains uh, an open marine basin, but the uh, basin to the west becomes restricted. So we see a uh, restricted uh, shelf with the restricted fauna and sometimes we even get a restriction to the extent of evaporite deposition. Now, if we move to the southern part of the, the, the Gulf, um, the Mishrif, uh, the Sanamanian uh, consists of um, Mishrif carbonate platform surrounding the Shilaif Basin. Uh, this is the work from Volker Var Varenkamp published uh, 2015. Uh, the western margin is stratigraphically complete and shows a number of uh, lateral prograde as the carbonate system builds out into the basin. But the eastern margin has been strongly modified by erosion. Uh, the topmost beds are missing uh, because of this late uh, top Mishrif unconformity. And it's I want to uh, demonstrate uh, the effects of this uh, unconformity in a bit more detail now. So again, quit out of uh, PowerPoint and go into uh, Stratbox. So these are a series of maps. Um, from the uh, middle Sanamanian from the high stand of the uh, K130 maximum flooding surface through to the low stand transgressive maximum flood and high stand of the overlying sequence. Now what I want to talk about here is not particularly the carbonate surrounding uh, the Mishra of Unconformity, but I actually want to focus in on this white area, this hole in the middle of the map. Now, this is some work by Cathy Hollis, who looked at the uh, relationship between the uh, Mishra of Unconformity and the um, reservoir quality and diagenesis of the carbonates underneath. And she published this section, which shows that there's fairly major um, down cutting of the unconformity uh, from Oman through UAE into Kuwait and then back up into uh, Iran. So this unconformity cuts down through various sequences uh, in the underlying carbonates. 
and this can be uh, this this illustrates quite nicely the area of uh, missing section. So now we're looking at a series of high stands, uh, transgressive and low stands. So the blank areas are in the low stand are partly due to drop in sea level rather than actual uh, uplift associated with the unconformity. So obviously the uh, exposed areas will expand during low stands and contract during high stands. And it's important to know where you are on the um, unconformity or relative in, in, in uh, because the um, diagenetic controls on the um, uh, reservoir quality depends firstly on fasces, as we've seen from the uh, example in um, Iraq, the, the Mishrif has very good primary porosity modified by cast and this is an example of very good reservoir quality, which comes from here on the uh, porosity permeability plot. So that's good reservoir quality, but sometimes you get cementation. Now this, uh, the effects of the uh, unconformity can improve reservoir quality by leaching, and it can also um, degrade reservoir quality by recrystallization. And this is strongly facies controlled. So if you were looking at reservoir quality, relative in the Mishrif, you would have to consider the effects of the um, diagenesis associated with the unconformity on the facies. So you could, uh, one application of these maps is to look at the depth of um, erosion at the top Mishrif unconformity and see how it impinges on different facies. So here you have erosion uh, represented by blank areas on the map superimposed on different facies. So you have an area of peritidal carbonates, uh, shallowest water, then you have an area of platform margin, shallow platform, deep platform and uh, basinal facies. So you would be able to at least estimate the original depositional reservoir quality and then the map the distribution of the effects of the unconformity or exposure during um, development of the unconformity uh, on the reservoir quality. And since you've got an, a range of maps, you can try to predict the depth of penetration of the uh, top Mishrif unconformity and how it impinges on different facies belts in different uh, sedimentary sequences. Um, since this is the last, last uh, slide with all the details of the paleogeographic maps, let me zoom in really close so you can see the sort of level of detail that uh, are used to compile these maps. Um, I'll just wait a moment for, for it to uh, catch up with the uh, resolution. Um, these maps are constructed by posting data from the different wells. We also use um, published uh, publications and all these annotations refer to a particular paper that we can justify the uh, data uh, that we've uh, mapped at these different localities. So these maps are all based on uh, published data and we provide sources for this uh, data. Okay, let me return to uh, PowerPoint. So I now want to finish off by just briefly summarizing the uh, late Cretaceous uh, systems. This is an isopac map of the upper Cretaceous. And again, depositional 
centres are most evident along, evident along the northeast margins of the plate, thinning to the southwest. We can see evidence that some fabric inherited from these north-south south structures uh, remained and controlling sedimentation. Um, if we look at the Turonian early Campanian, this is super sequence five of AP9. Um, it commences with the regional unconformity that I've just discussed. Um, initial deposition during the Turonian is very localized in these intrashaft basins. And the reflooding of emergent areas commences later in the uh, Turonian, initially in the northern part of the plate. And then we have a phase of major structuration during the Coniacian with the development of these uh, high relief north south paleo highs. Then we begin to see the onset of rifting, um, perhaps with a strike slip component um, due to inter intraplate uh, stresses, um, because we now begin to see the onset of uh, closure of near tethys and uh, compression. And the elevated areas are onlapped by some. Santonian Campanian times, and this represents the mid Santonian high stand with these large carbonate platforms um, onlapping the structural highs surrounding by, surrounded by intrashelf basins. Some reservoir fasces are developed at this time, and some source and seal fasces, but these are often very complex and often quite localized. Uh, moving up to the late Campanian and Maastrichtian, um, this is a summary of super sequence. Uh, six, a significant syn sedimentary tectonism due to ophiolite abduction along the uh, continental margin. And we see development of transtensional basins, often very uh, deep. And again, on the Arabian side of the plate, we see large scale carbonate platform uh, development, and but also locally thick carbonate platforms on the active margin to the northeast side here for example and then within the center we have deep uh deep water miles becoming very condensed uh towards the end uh, end of the cretaceous and finally super sequence uh six we also see uh, because we're getting convergent we get we begin to see clastic input input of flish systems on the northeast side starting in the uh, northern part of the plate locally developed intra low plan platform systems fringing these high stand platforms these are um normal carbonate systems like in the bab basin when you get a low stand this is just the normal carbonate system migrating out into the uh, uh what are now shallower parts of the uh, surrounding basins and these are quite important in central iraq and syria and we also begin to see um some of the basins being cut off with the development of uh, evaporites in, in these intrashelf basins. Okay, so th thank you very much for your time. Um, I hope to explain more about these Cretaceous carbonate systems in a virtual workshop um, on the 30th of October to the 3rd of November. And please go to uh, websites of Image Reality and Cambridge Carbonates for, for further details. And uh, I'm uh, ready to take questions if there are any. Thank you very much for your time. Hello, Peter. <clears throat> um, thank you very much for this uh, uh, very interesting uh, webinar. Um, Peter, I have a question for you. Um, with the, these uh, structural controls, the faults that north south fault, north south faults that you see, north south faults that you see on the Arabian plate controlling phases distribution, uh, have you been able to determine as well control on on the genesis as well and in on in reservoir quality? Um, the diagenesis is is. is mainly controlled by um, depositional facies and any superimposed unconformities. There are examples where we have um, deep-seated um, diagenesis taking place. For example, we often see hydrothermal dolomites uh, developed. Um, they're locally uh, developed in, in Kuwait 
and uh, they're also uh, locally developed in uh, northern Iraq. And there, there are some very spectacular examples exposed uh, in, Ira in Iran where we have um, dolomite bodies associated with these deep-seated uh, faults. But the main um, role of these deep-seated faults, they're inherited from Precambrian structures, and these form sort of structural hinges that, that maybe undergo uplift or, or uh, differential subsidence during, um, mainly during phases of uh, plate tectonic realignment. Um, thank you, Peter. Um, and uh, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the course? Uh, what's going to happen during during the course? Uh, what we're going to do is um, we're going to have a um, five times half day course. So that's five half days uh, looking at some of the looking at these case histories that I presented on Stratbox. Uh, looking at them in a bit more detail and also presenting other case histories on Stratbox. And we will be also, uh, I'll be presenting um, workflows, um, relevant case histories to try to um, explain the, um, the, the Cretaceous systems in more details and also to um, show you the workflows to try and understand these and i'll be covering um core logging carbonate facies diagenesis uh seismic expression of carbonate systems um and log data as well okay so one of the things that the stratbox the platform you know that that, that we have uh, enables is to uh, uh, allow allow uh, participants cross participants to have interactivity with the maps and and or images etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, will will they be using uh, this doing this type of exercises during the workshop yes yes okay yes great. i hope to show um more examples uh, of, of these maps in more detail Okay, I think Gabriela has a question. I do, I do, Peter. There is a question that's come in from a LinkedIn user. Uh, I will try and uh, um, give it, do it justice. Um, so, thanks, Peter. One question. What is going on in Ras al Kamar and especially beyond towards the east where the faces are quickly becoming basinal? Do we have a sharp transition from platform to basin? Do you think we still have platform faces beneath the Hajar Mountains? Um, that's a very difficult um, place place to work with. Um, as as far as we can tell, um, it, it, it at, at the moment our, our maps are showing mainly basinal facies, but that that is an area we need to uh, look at in more detail. Um, the problem is uh, once you get into that part of the uh, plate, you, you you have to look below all the ophelites and all the structure. Uh, that, that, that that's developed. Um, ev evidence suggests that we probably don't have a, a sharp transition from platform to basin. And I think the um, actual position will change through time uh, as, as um, the um, carbonate production varies and also the uh, uh, structure of the margin uh, evolves. But that, that's something we... Um, are going to have to look at in more detail. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Peter. And I have another question here, uh, which I'll just again put up on the screen. Um, that should be moving away now. Yep. Okay, so thank you, Peter. You showed that the last Schubach cycle downstep dramatically into the intra-shelf basin. Is this a stranded cycle with lateral seals or is there connectivity to the other clinoforms? Um, I, th I think you'd have to look at um, your own data set to um, answer, answer that question. Um, it, it's the, the answer is um, possibly both, but um, I think it might depend on the very local geometry of the, the uh, BAB shelf margins of the, the, the sequence two to four cycles. Um, so I, I I think you probably have to look at uh, uh, your 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 own data and try and map out the uh, geometries uh, in that, in that case. Okay, thank you, Peter. I don't see any other questions on here at the moment. 
um, there may be others um, that come through at a later stage. So uh, it would be possible for people to post further questions, perhaps in the in the in the webinar that we're having this afternoon. There'll be another webinar this afternoon, won't there, Peter, to catch yep. the next time zone. So that's yep. at three p.m. UK time, and uh, it will be the same content. But you know, there may be other questions that that would uh, would originate, so you could have access to that as well. Um, Oh, actually, no, there is one more question that's just come in. Sorry, just give me a moment while I read that out and put it on the screen. Here we go. So thanks a lot, Peter. One additional question. What would be the differences or similarities with the other side of the Tethys-like Burgonian faces? Um, I, I don't think that there would be too many differences because we are uh, just opposite sides of the same ocean um we're in the same faunal zone um so i i i think you'd have to again you'd have to look at the sort of local um tectonic uh, configuration of the basin which probably more, would have more um influence on the facies patterns but i think you'd be essentially essentially dealing with the same uh, bioclast assemblages and um general carbonate uh, systems Okay, great. Thank you, Peter. Perhaps we'll give it a few more minutes because some more questions might come through. I have a, a, a question for, for Peter. Okay. And, and this is more like a kind of a personal question, Peter. Mm -hmm. What got you so interested in uh, carbonates and becoming an expert on carbonate reservoirs? What's your story there? Um, well, I, I did my PhD at... Um, well, uh, go back further. Um, my undergraduate degree was at Leeds, which was a very um, strongly uh, structural department. And we did some plastic sedimentology and we had two lectures on carbonates, two weeks on carbonates. So I, ju I just thought this is something um, I need to find out more about. And uh, a PhD came up at Manchester on carbonates, which was I was very interested in. And I, at that time, carbonate sedimentology wasn't really as, as developed as plastic sedimentology was. So I felt there was a real opportunity to sort of um, push the subject along and uh, do research in it that uh, with perhaps a different slant that nobody's thought, a uh, few people had thought of before. And, and also at that time, there was great interest in the Carboniferous Limestone of, of, of the UK, uh, mm -hmm. the Denantian, and there was as quite a strong group um, of researchers working on the Carboniferous Limestone. I was one of them, Andy um, Horbury, my colleague who did much of the regional work on the maps was another one. And we're basically a sort of group of people who knew each other were all working on the Carboniferous Limestone. There was, so there was a sort of nice environment and atmosphere to get started. So, mm -hmm. and it, it all sort of started from there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. Um, do we have any more questions, Gabby? Mm, not that I can see come through at the moment, just uh, obviously thanking you for, for your time, Peter. For an interesting um Thank you. For an interesting webinar but no there doesn't appear to be to be anything else so i don't know whether um uh, you want to hold on or you want to wrap it up um i th i think uh, that uh, as 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 gabriella said there'll be opportunities to ask questions um through the linkedin uh website or or contact us personally um so if you can think of any other questions, we're happy to answer them. But I'd just like to say thank you to everyone for their for their time and attention. And I hope I've um, uh, made a useful contribution to your day. Thank you very much, Peter. Yes. Yeah. And we look forward to uh, seeing you on, on the um, virtual uh, workshop later on. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Have a good day. Thank you.